and I'm looking at um, the experience of people who are learning to sew clothes for themselves. Um, they're not necessarily motivated by issues of sustainability, but I'm interested in it within that context because I think obviously uh, it's a really big issue. Uh, the impact of the fashion industry is enormous. That is drawing more people to home sewing, but home sewing in its in itself has has seen a revival with um, you know a kind of on the whole online craft revival over the last 10, 20 years. So yeah, I'm interested in those experiences and what we might learn from people who are trying to do this um, about our relationship with clothes or their relationship with clothes and um, whether there's anything in that that is useful to us in thinking about alternative fashion futures. And how's that research going? It sounds very interesting. Oh, it's going, it's going well. I'm kind of right in the middle of it in a way in that I've done a lot of the participatory aspect of the research, which due to COVID-19 all had to happen um, remotely. So I'm still part way through the analysis, but I'm also starting to write from, from, that, um, from that research. So. And what are you finding about people's experiences? Can you give us a little taste of that? Yeah, well, so uh, I think there's been a the way that the kind of home sewing market has changed means that a lot more people are kind of attracted to it and are trying to learn for themselves at home. So the generation of kind of indie pattern makers, um, PDF patterns, all of this stuff being more easily accessible, being able to see more people doing sewing online with its YouTube tutorials or getting inspiration from Instagram or whatever. Um, so people are attracted to this, uh, it's not necessarily as easy for them as they imagine it, it might be, but I think I'm learning a lot about how people understand clothes or what we don't understand about our clothes and actually learning to, to kind of make them for yourself uh, is a kind of eye-opener to some of that. And also it's uh, interesting to me that um, there's not making your own clothes isn't necessarily a particularly sustainable practice it depends how you go about it and I think there's a lot in the kind of home sewing market which is just a continuation of the same thing of always being able to have more make more um, so yeah it's giving me some insight into into that and how uh, those skills might be angled differently depending on the kind of resources that people use or where they get inspiration from. Um, There's a bit to unpack there, isn't there? There's quite a lot to unpack there. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe can, can we talk generally about, um, you know, the whole um, the fashion model of, you know, continuous growth and consumption and there is talk of circularity. I mean, is that going to help? Do you, can you give us some insight to what yeah, your thinking is so there? I suppose I'm coming to this as somebody who's always made my own clothes or had the ability to make my own clothes. I couldn't say I've always <laughs> made everything I've worn. That's not true. Um, but I'm coming at this from the point of view of kind of realising that we can't just keep growing. So it's definitely, I'm looking at this from a post-growth point of view been very influenced by the work of Kate Fletcher, um, the book Craft of Youth and um, uh, yet the post-growth thinking, uh, which moves us away from this idea of having more, which I think a lot of the stuff that happens in the sort of circularity space um, kind of traps us in a sy system where we continue to just have m more of the same. So you know we start to recycle polyester but we don't question whether polyester is a thing that we should be kind of constantly putting out in the world um, and particularly I mean my understanding it's not my area of expertise but my understanding of polyester is that you need new polyester to put with the recycled polyester you can't endlessly recycle polyester and polyester uh, leaches fibres into the environment so actually not resolving the fact that the the problem of whether we need all of this to keep growing the fashion industry um, is it, kind of not addressed if we keep just thinking about it in terms of circularity. So I'm interested in how we can think about other fashion futures, other alternatives. Uh, my supervisor, I'm doing a PhD, my supervisor is Amy Twigger-Holroyd and I've been very influenced by her 
work, um, both the book Folk Fashion and also the Fashion Fictions project that she's currently running, which is online trying to imagine um, alternative fashion futures and how else we might think about this, how else we might look at our clothes. Uh, and I suppose for me, I'm interested in where sewing skills, craft skills come into that. Mm. And um, obviously it's useful to have some sort of agency and autonomy to do things differently. Are you finding that within your study or yourself personally? Well, so I find that with myself personally, um, I, I, I don't think I've done enough of the analysis to have kind of rooted through where that sits for my participants. Um, but for myself personally, I suppose one of the things that drove me to do the research in the first place was with an increasing awareness of the environmental impact of the fashion industry and I've, you know, I've always loved clothes, I've always enjoyed buying clothes, uh, I buy a lot of my clothes second hand and always have, but, um, uh, but increasing awareness of that aspect of the fashion industry has really made me value the skills that I have, the sewing skills that I have that I've, that I've had since I was a child, um, yet yeah, they give me a choice. They give me a choice so I can choose not to buy clothes but I can still have things that are new and different. I can evolve the clothes I already have. I can make use of things that are, you know, otherwise discarded. Um, and that, I suppose, is quite a powerful thing to have that I, d I actually don't have to buy into this thing because I have some skills to throw into it. And so I'm interested in how people are learning those because we don't teach them routinely at school. People don't necessarily have the skills to pass on at home. So we've got a generation, at least, of people who who know relatively little about this and are interested. You know, I had over a hundred people wanted to be part. You know, when I put out the call for people to participate in my research, I had over a hundred responses, and it only needed five people. So. Um, so there is, you're finding there's a lot of interest in... at the moment. You just have to look at the amount of stuff that there is online about, um, uh, you know, home sewing and, you know, the popularity of the Great British Sewing Bee, which is on TV at the moment. It's got something like 4, 000, uh, 4 million viewers last year. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely something that's captured people's interest. Mm. And just from the, the five that you've followed, um, just wondering um, ab about their, their social and emotional well-being benefits that might have come from sewing. Do you have any sense of that or, you know? Well, it's, it's interesting you should say that because um, I've just been looking at uh, some of the emotions they expressed in the, in the interviews uh, we did. So, um, yeah, where we were looking at their experiences of sewing. Actually, they'd videoed themselves doing their sewing activities and we were talking through those. Um, talking about the things that they'd written about in the diaries and the things that they'd made. Um, so they talked about emotions quite a lot and along with the kind of increasing confidence in their sewing ability, not necessarily in life in general, but kind of increasing confidence, um, in the enjoyment they got from it, the excitement they had about doing it and about learning more, those are all, all there but there's also obviously in learning to do any new craft there's kind of frustration and you know anxiety about using these materials and whether it's going to work out and how it's going to fit you and whether you're going to want it when it's finished and I mean for the context that I'm looking at it in the wearable garment is the more sustainable garment so but there's a lot of anxiety for beginners about whether they're even going to be able to bring this thing together um, into something uh, that they can wear so yeah and the instructions that they have at their fingertips and what they're able to find online makes a big difference to how successful they are. So mostly, mostly positive feelings and outcomes or not necessarily? I would say 50-50 actually. Mm. Um, yeah, they're all very enthusiastic and they all want to continue. So I think the enjoyment, the excitement, the interest that it's uh, provoked in them is, is one thing. Finding the time to do that is, is probably the main uh, limiting factor but it does it does come also with some kind of downsides I suppose they're the things that, that put you off or that you change your you change your making behavior to try and avoid that disappointment so whether that's you know learning new skills or 
just avoiding doing certain <laughs> certain things. You know, it's different for different people, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so, can you speculate about the you know the mental health, mental well being aspects that might come from more generally having more um, agency and awareness about clothing, where they come from, being able to style ourselves. You know, how how can how can this benefit our mental well-being? Yeah, I don't know. I think in the in the research, and I haven't looked at this bit yet, but there's definitely something about people kind of finding their style, understanding what their style is. So they're kind of enthusiastic to make, but then they might en end up making something that actually isn't really for them uh, because they're maybe going into it with not a, a very kind of complete sense of, of what they they want and really aware that sewing gives them choice once they've got the skills to make what they want to make so it's yeah it's a long it's a long journey to to potentially get to that point but um the uh, and thrifting might play a big part there as an as an experimental opportunity to work out style yeah well i mean there's a lot more kind of thrifting going on i mean that's the way it seems there's a lot more um not just there's always been a lot of charity shops in the uk but um uh, a lot more kind of more curated second-hand shops where um you know they look a bit more like boutiques so yeah i mean i think there's a lot more of that going on being, people being a bit more experimental um with their clothes and their style and what they want to wear but um yeah i think it's wouldn't it be a great thing if everybody had that, if everybody knew what it was for them? And do you think that's part of a solution to reducing textile waste is, um, you know, having some skills as well as maybe really understanding what's right for us rather than having to feel like we need to follow fashion trends? Um, yes, I would imagine, of course, if we all knew that, then we wouldn't be pulled this way and that by the latest fashions but um it's something that you i don't know maybe you build up over time i mean there's a lot of like well like with sewing with finding your style there's quite a lot of trial and error isn't isn't there and if yeah maybe maybe thrifting is part of that kind of that it's a way of putting together different looks and experimenting with things rather than necessarily just having what comes off the shelf but I can remember I mean I've always bought a lot of second hand, hand clothes myself and I can remember a few years ago maybe a decade ago somebody who I saw as a very confident person saying to me you have to be really confident to shop second hand and I thought I'd never really thought about that that you have to choose the thing that you think is kind of presentable and how you want to present yourself without it being kind of sanctioned by the latest fashion season. It really honestly never occurred to me that that takes a certain amount of confidence. Mm. Um, um, how, how do you find the attitude to thrifting's changed over time now? You know, probably driven a bit by a sustainability agenda. Yeah, well, I, I kind of think, I definitely sense that it's changed over the last maybe, I know, four or five years that there seem to be more um, more of those kind of shops, higher visibility of it. Uh, my background, many years ago, I worked in charity shops and I think, you know, there's, there's always been an, a, a kind of association with thrifting and with, with need, with, with poverty, which is maybe unhelpful um, a, 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 and maybe is changing now over time because people are coming back to it as, um, as a more sustainable you know, coming back to second hand as a possibility for more sustainable um, ways to dress. So yeah, maybe maybe that's something that is on is on the move. So what else do you think needs to change to kind of be living in a sustainable future? Because it's quite scary really what we see and and that, that fashion production and consumption continues to rise despite more awareness about the issues. Yeah, I feel like um, the the shift in attitudes that there's kind of creativity, positivity, and joy possibly in having less 
so not con continual growth not continually having more but actually thinking about how things could be different how to use materials differently how to you know wear your clothes differently exchange all of those things all of those other I suppose what I'm trying to say is I see an awful lot of uh, possibility creativity in what those what those alternatives could could be is this driven by individuals or societies or intellectuals academics like yourself or what um i think all of those things i think multiple different tactics um i can definitely see more people interested in making their own clothes i can definitely see more people thrifting i can definitely see more people in an academic space trying to think about alternative fashion futures I think all of that is full of creative possibility and I think the kind of never-ending growth of the current fashion industry for me doesn't present possibility it only presents more of the same and we're aware now of the problems both in production and in um, at, you know just the end of life of clothes we're aware of all of that and so to continue doing that in the current um, environmental situation just doesn't make any sense so for me the creativity is in in what these alternatives are and it's hard it's hard to think outside of the current kind of model that we have because we're so used to it but but yeah it's not sustainable we know it's not sustainable so does government need to be involved in some way or can it be, you know, is legislation useful to Yes, stop? I'm sure. Um, I'm, I'm sure it is. I don't, have, I don't have the answers. They don't seem very willing to pick up on the recommendations that have been made uh, time and again about how you might regulate some of this stuff because they don't seem to be that interested in, in kind of managing things differently so so change from the ground up I think might a be a lot of mm. yeah I, I think anything we can do to amplify this appetite for other ways of doing things has got to be a good a good thing and freeing people to think about the possibility of things being different and I'm not suggesting that everybody should be making all of their own clothes that's really not where I'm coming from but I just by looking at what's going on in those spaces, we can understand different ways of being with clothes, different ways of using clothes, different ways of appreciating uh, the materials that go into clothes. All of those things are valuable knowledge if we're going to kind of work our way out of the, the current kind of environmental situation that we're still contributing. And there's nothing like um getting a needle and thread and um, engaging in some basic mending project to help you understand, you know, I guess what's involved with your clothes and the complexity of it and start you on a journey perhaps of being more involved. Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, there's a lot more going on in the kind of the mending space, I suppose, that than, than there ever has been before, like the, the whole kind of trend for more visible mending and so like greater aware, greater awareness of, of that kind of stuff and I really came at this from the point of view well if you know how to, if you know how clothes work if you if you know how clothes are made then your ability to mend them and alter them is greater than you know maybe because I didn't come into this from a mending point of view I came into it from a from, from a making uh, point of point of view and I think um, there's something about understanding how clothes are structured, how they come together, how they fit on your body. That is a really, uh, you know, it's a really valuable thing to under to understand, and it opens up other possibilities. But yeah, I mean, my own sewing practice has moved much more into a kind of mending and altering pre-existing things and using the leftover materials from that to. To, to make other things so it's yeah just be, thinking about this stuff more has shifted me more into a space of, um, of of mending I mean I've always done some mending but I'm now now that I'm not throwing anything <laughs> not throwing anything out and trying to reuse materials as much as possible then I'm, I'm also looking at those other uh, um, 
you know, those other craft skills that have often been associated with kind of poverty in the past, but are now, you know, coming back into into vogue. So, you know, borrow mending and um, patchwork and visible mending and darning and all of those things, which, you know, weren't my original interest. I'm kind of being drawn back towards those as well, which is, it's fun because it means I'm learning something new as well. And um, tell us about your skirt. Um, th 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 how did this come to be? Uh, well, so this is this is kind of typical of my uh, current ways of making things, I suppose. I found this skirt in a junk shop. Um, it was stuffed amongst um, some dusty old boxes of board games. And I just I saw the fabric and I pulled it out. And it was a skirt that somebody had obviously tried to make. Um, and it was a kind of tube, straight tube basket and some sort of fairly rough uh, pleats to it um, and I couldn't resist it I couldn't resist the fabric it was re it's a really nice kind of Indian cotton fabric um, so yeah I bought it for three pounds took it apart and basically made the skirt that I thought it wanted to be so it was it, it was a version of what I thought the person had originally tried to make but uh, yeah to, to fit me and my uh, preferences I guess so it, you know, it's become a current favourite. It's very comfortable. <laughs> and um, and I guess that's the thing, isn't it? Being able to make things the way you want them to be is very empowering. Yes, yes. And I think that's one of the things that these beginner sewers are attracted to. That if, if they can learn to sew, then they can have things the way they want them. So within your um, friendship group or people you run into, uh, what proportion of people do you think have, have a, a, like, a bit like you where, you know, you've got some agency? Is it, very is it a few. Mm. Very few. Um, I mean, kind of growing up, yeah, I was pretty much the only person I knew who knew how to sew. So if people wanted... Um, if people wanted things well I, I mean when I was at university I ended up making costumes for plays because I was with a, a bunch of people who were um, you know interested on in putting on am amateur productions nobody else knew how to sew so you know it, th things like that and making and altering or kind of making things for friends people have come to me over the years because I'm the only person they know who knows how to do it but um, I don't know how typical that is I don't know that that uh, tells us anything but I, well it does I it the, shows the breadth of the need to perhaps extend skills yeah I think I came at the tail end of an era when these skills were passed on at home um, I didn't learn a massive amount about sewing at school um, but I know that's kind of that's dropped off so my generation if my friends are in any way typical the majority of them don't know how to sew so they don't have the skills to pass on so we've definitely missed a, a generation and it's it's been squeezed out of the, the school curriculum as well so I suppose that's why I'm interested in how people are now learning to do it because there's the interest there's a lot of online content there's a lot of kind of visibility of it on TV or whatever people are attracted to it so how are they actually encountering it when they uh, they decided something that they want to be able to do. That's what I'm. That's what my research really looks into.